Okay, welcome everyone. Welcome to the new normal. I'm Brian Morrissey. I'm the president and editor chief of Digiday. Um, this is, I think, our fourth episode. So we're doing these each Friday. Um, obviously, lots of people doing webinars and stuff like this. We think of this as more than a webinar, um, and we'll keep evolving it. But you know, the idea is to have a show and to use um, this new normal uh, in order to develop a new product. Um, and so. Very happy today to be joined by Pat Keen, the CEO of Action Network, to talk um, about how, how they're evolving. Um, so I want to go through some of the key things that are uh, happening right now in the sports industry. Um, you know, the first and foremost is the reality is, you know, the numbers are in and sports sites have been hit hard. This is not a surprise, right? There are no live sports now. Live sports are coming back. You know, our society would collapse without live sports. Um, the FT had a great uh, column by Simon Cooper about why about why football or soccer still matters. Um, you know, and and the impact it has with making people feel part of a community. So, I know a lot of people like to say sports are just kind of like nothing, but they actually serve a really important um, societal um, uh, role, as well as being a gigantic economic engine. Um, and culturally, I think it's important is um, betting is going mainstream. When we talk about the sports, I know, um, you know, Pat and I uh, actually were just a couple of years away from each other growing up outside Philadelphia and like sports. I remember hearing like my like grandfather, like ran numbers at some bar he had in like Upper Darby. It was like kind of a degenerate activity. Um, and even in like college, there was always some like weird guy from like New Falls, Mass, who like had like a bookie and stuff. That's changing, you know. Already, 18 states have have legalized uh, to some degree. Um, I believe five are now fully mobile. Um, the combination of of mobile and just this cultural shift is going to make uh, sports gambling uh, completely mainstream. If it's not already, uh, this is happening. You see it with younger generations. Um, the other thing is the sports betting industry is is adapting, you know, like sports is going away, but just like every single industry, you know, the, the, the betting industry can't just um, stay still. Um, you can bet on anything now. You can even bet on, on you know, weirdly on coronavirus and, and on deaths. It's terrible. Um, but you can bet on, on Belarusian um, tennis, uh, table tennis as well. And you can bet on the presidential election. You can bet on all sorts of different things. You know, people's appetite for, 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 uh, for betting is not going away. And so the betting industry is um, adapting. And the other thing is this crisis will probably, and I want to, I'm going out on a limb here because Pat would know better, but accelerate legalization. All of these states are in dire straits. Okay, and that is because they need to find revenue sources. And guess what? Nobody wants to raise taxes. So what they want to do is they want to legalize things like cannabis and gambling in order to take their own cut because this stuff is already happening. And when governments see a way to get revenue without being the one that gets slammed for raising taxes, they're always going to take it. So my guess is knowing how politicians work, they're gonna accelerate the legalization of gambling. Um, and finally, um, this all fits the overall trend when we see monetization. And, I, and, and Pat has been um, in this, this world going back, to, going back to Google and even before then, Jupiter Research. Um, and he knows, you know, the, the, the shift that we're seeing is publishers realize they got to get direct, they got to get closer to the transaction. And so more of publisher monetization, whether that's through commerce or whether it's frankly through selling subscriptions, it's moving to getting to a direct transaction. Okay. And so gambling is perfectly fit in this. So I want to bring in Pat. That was my, my little intro. Pat. Great, great one. Good to see you again, Brian. Thank you. Glad to see now, let's just reminisce for a second what our first, what the what the first sort of live event we did together. Paint a picture. Picture yourself in a downtown Chinese restaurant in the mid or late '90s, and I just learned earlier. I, we joke about it every time we talk, but I didn't realize that was the first moderation duty you had ever done. First one. And, and I I believe, and I mentioned a name that probably no one in this this call will know or this experience. A guy named Edmund Sanctus, who ran digital for NBC, who I think was also on that panel. Uh, yeah, so and, there was uh, a breakfast panel in a Chinese restaurant. So, and now, and now here we are, you in Eastern Long Island, me in suburban Philadelphia, um, and, and we're doing it over Zoom. It's an amazing world. It, it is, it is. 
So for those who don't know, explain the Action Network and explain what excited you about the Action Network. You, you've been at, at, at Google, at CBS, uh, Associated Content, which is sold to Yahoo. What, why Action Network? The Action Network is a product, content, and technology platform that enables sports bettors more data, information, and tools to make them smarter bettors. We would like to see all sports fans become legal and responsible sports bettors, but we create tools and content and data to help you inform. One of our most important parts of our product is the ability to track your bets. So we talked earlier today is a huge day in the world of sports betting. May 1st is the first day that Colorado is offering legal sports betting. So if you're in the state of Colorado, hopefully sports will return in mass very soon. You can place a wager in that state and then track your bet in our platform. And that is a really powerful tool. We are also evolving and building products like BetSync, where you're able to sync your bet almost like you would a Mint or a, uh, or a Robinhood or Yahoo Finance, where you're able to sync those bets. So we're really a tools-driven, a content-driven, and a subscription platform. We, like you at Digiday, really do believe that people will pay for highly verticalized content that informs a decision. And our decision that it informs is how you place a wager and how you place a future bet. And all of the numbers have proven, and you mentioned earlier, 18 states legal, five states that are fully mobile in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Indiana, and now Colorado, which we're incredibly excited about. Colorado is going to be a massive opportunity in the category. And I went to the business because... I'm a, I'm a huge sports fan, as you know. We've been friends for a long time. I really believe in sports. I personally was never a big better before I came to the company, but it is so fun. It is so engaging, and it creates a communal experience around sports that I've never experienced in my life. So uh, I just before we get too deep into I, it. I love this. There, there you have 12-year-old Chad Millman. He looks yeah. great. <laughs> He's just like popping up out of the Oh, out it's amazing. Of the uh, like before we get to on Chad. The, on the 40 different calls I have with him every single day. Chad's, uh, you know, this is, by the way, a great, a great tradition of this industry is using out-of-date headshots. So <laughs> just continuing it. Um, I think I've got one from from the Chinese restaurant gig that, <laughs> that I'm still using. Uh, but uh, please do use the Q and A function. We want to make this as interactive as possible. I promise you, I will ask your question. Um, and uh, so you can do it anonymously too. So it can be it can be spicy if you'd like. Um, but Action Network was formed by Churnin Group. And I, I find Churnin Group's like approach to the media industry, it's like media and commerce, I don't really know, like fascinating. They're, they're in a lot of interesting businesses. Um, so explain the business model and why this is different from a, just a normal publisher like that is, you know, looking to amass yep. an audience and then monetize. Yep. I mean, and we, we still, we still do some conventional things. We have, we, we do kind of sponsorship, not in a typical display kind of experience, but the primary, primary drivers of revenue for our business are subscription users paying at different tiers based on their enthusiasm and support sports better or their skill anywhere from $5 a month up to $250 a month. Think of that Bloomberg terminal type experience. If you were a, a very avid sports better. Uh, but then what we think and are pretty confident is going to be the bigger opportunity for our business is an affiliate platform. So we convert our millions of users to become betters on legal sports books that we partner with. So I mentioned in Colorado, we would partner with a business like PointsBet or William Hill or any of the other large, you look at FanDuel and DraftKings that are going to be in these markets. So we partner with them in New Jersey and in Pennsylvania, Indiana and West Virginia. We will soon be in Colorado. And what you're able to do through those partnerships is generate a CPA or cost per acquisition because our users are betting with the most frequently. They're the most sophisticated. And it's really a massive land grab. I mean, I think the people that are familiar with most are FanDuel and DraftKings, but there are many new entrants coming into the category. So to be able to acquire a customer in a legal state is a huge opportunity to be able to have that user. And it's interesting, you know, in the US, we're, we're net new to sports betting for the most part in the legal basis, but in Europe, it's massive. Most yeah. bettors in Europe have an average of five and a half apps on their phone, and they want to get the best odds, the best uh, prices. And so people are shoppers and they want to go to where they're the best opportunity. And we create through content and through product and through things like BetSync an opportunity to convert our users through really great offers through those platforms. So 
explain the sort of lines though. Like, I mean, you don't want to take bets, right? Absolutely not. No, it's a very good question. We are, we are not an operator. We're very different than those properties. We really want to be an introductory platform into those businesses. But, you know, think of us more like an Expedia or a Travelocity, a uh, challenging reference with the travel industry being such wow. challenging. You got to get another one. Like but in the sense that we're a two-sided marketplace, we're a marketplace <laughs> yeah. that allows for both supply and demand. So but why won't, why won't the, the providers want to just do the do the media themselves and rather than, you know, I mean, won't, won't you come in con conflict ultimately with your, your people paying you? Uh, not necessarily. I mean, well, the, the user wants the best offers they can get full stop. So whether that, you know, that's one of the things that we do, we create unique offers. So our content team will produce unique offers in partnership with one of the books, um, whether it's you know a Super Bowl offer we did around the 49. You get both sides of a 49ers plus 50, and you know it's almost free money because again they're really trying to convert you into those books. But remember, DraftKings and FanDuel from their DFS days, they've been really they've built very powerful brands, and all, a lot of those platforms are you know they're wrapping buses going back and forth from New Jersey to New York and Pennsylvania, etc. But to be able to have what we think is the tip of the spear in terms of audience. Our entire audience full stop is sports bettors. So you're going to get a lot of looky loos in other kind of general environments. If you're doing a lot of television, if you're doing a lot of outdoor, you're going to probably not get the most um, yield necessarily or the most efficiency with your ad spend. We yeah. are the most efficient acquisition tool for full stop in their entire marketing stack or partnership so, stack. So basically you have an intent based traffic. I mean, you know this from Google, right? I mean, yep. <laughs> yep. Like people you are coming there with intent. That's absolutely right. And, and a lot of them are, are sports bettors to begin with, but at the same time, there are so many net new opportunities with all of these states coming on board and all of these new books. You know, Penn National did their deal with Barstool. That was all about customer acquisition and trying to lower the cost of acquisition because these are, these are pretty significant investments that they need to do. But if you're able to assume and be able to build the right lifetime value and build an acquisition funnel that makes sense, um, you know, it's pretty simple math to spend money in our platform to acquire users versus just broadly spending to try and catch a, a sports better in an environment where you presume them to be. So Tommy Bohr is in with the uh, Burr, maybe, I don't know, uh, yeah. is in with the first question, which is, uh, which is one I was just going to get to, Tommy, I swear, but I'll give it to you anyway, which is he talked about where you are with monetizing the app from an advertising standpoint. Maybe I could just like expand that and say, what is your What's the revenue portfolio right now of, of Action Network? I mean, advertising is de minimis. It's very small. Uh, the overwhelming majority for today is that combination of subscription and affiliate. In terms of advertising, I mean, we certainly have, you know, we're not going to be at the scale of an ESPN or a CBS Sports or some of the other entities that are sort of more broadly appealing to a general sports fan. But, you know, we do deals with points bet, which is a uh, is a challenger upstart brand in, out of Australia that is now in New Jersey and will be in Colorado as well. And they will do sponsorships. So they will sponsor some of our talent. So Darren Ravel, who is, who is one of our talent and producers and senior producers at Action Network, we did a really fun fade Ravel uh, experience with points bet where you got, if, if Darren lost a bet, he'd have to do a, a, a stupid or fun feat of some kind. And that was a six-figure deal that looks like sponsorship, but is not bought on a CPM. It's not bought on would be would be traditional display or advertising metrics. But you know, we we really don't want to clutter because it's a subscription experience. We don't want to clutter our experience with uh, ads and non sort of targeted to your point that you mentioned earlier about Google. Really high intent, high user experience driven uh, 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 ad content. Okay, so uh, we actually have a, another question from, uh, I always mispronounce Ava's name, Ava Seed, I believe. Um, so what are your sources for, for uh, your own audience? Like, are you like search dependent or are you, do people say, hey, I'm a gambler. I know I'm going to the Action Network. I, I th you know, search is certainly a very huge component of what we do. So there's, there's, SEO hasn't gone away. There's sort of been in many ways a resurgence of SEO and the importance of SEO. So SEO drives a lot of our engagement and a lot of our acquisition, but we also need to know that like today is a great example. If you do a search for sports betting Colorado, we're going to be number one or two in natural search results. So 
that kind of reality is going to be very important. But we do typical kind of acquisition marketing that you might see. We're not doing it today because there really isn't sports to support it. But we will buy in social platforms. We will buy across search. Unfortunately, Twitter is not taking content ads for sports betting, which I think is absurd, particularly as these sites become more and more legal. But we also have, to your point, a high intent user who's familiar with the brand, who is an avid sports better and knows from our talent, you know, Chad and his team, Chad Millman, who runs content, has hired a great organization for talent and our products and tools are, are best in class. So a sports better knows that from just the general market of, of an affiliation and knowledge of sports betting is Action Network is the number one property to track your bets and to find information about how to bet. Okay, so we are now 20 minutes into this. I give, I give with all the podcasts and this now 20 minute uh, time to not mention coronavirus, but the 20 minutes is up, coronavirus. I'm on uh, Action's site right now. Um, and I, I, you can usually tell a lot from a nav bar, you know, how people organize internally and what is most important and you go left to right. NFL, not happening. NBA, not happening. Golf, through a golf bet, not happening. MMA. Soon, soon though, we have two weeks. MMA. You're going to have golf in two weeks. Okay. I'm, I'm talking now, though. MMA, okay. God, not happening. Esports happening. And then you get on to the sports calendar, best books, and stuff like this. You're in a challenging near term. I think long term, you, I seems to me all the, the trends are in the right direction. Near term, oh, God. Yeah, it's, it's not a pretty picture. Um, we are a business that thrives on sports being live, that sports happening. We're immaterial to if those sports have fans or not. Um, you know, I, I think the sports experience being a communal one is desirous of having fans, but the reality of our business is if people can bet on sports and they can watch sports on TV and can engage with their friends in a community respect to sports betting, our business is going to do just fine. But to your point, there's a lot of unpredictability. The rumors about Major League Baseball returning in early July. We're going to have a couple of golf events just in the next few weeks. There's the Tiger Phil, Tom Brady, Peyton Manning match that's going to be at the end of this month. And then in a few weeks, there's going to be a tailor made, uh, made for charity COVID relief event that's going to be Dustin Johnson, Rory McElroy, Ricky Fowler, and Matt Hoa, um, which will be fun. And our community, I think you're going to see ratings for these kinds of events that are going to be extraordinary. If you look at what happened with the NFL draft, which we even saw a higher and larger audience for our content this year than we did pre-COVID last year. So I think there's just a massive desire for people to say, I've watched all the money heist and uh, whatever Netflix show they're binging on today, Faldo was me, that was an amazing show. Um, but yeah, people, you're, gonna, you're gonna see ratings that are gonna look like Cheers final season. Um, yeah, it's no, gonna I be mean- extraordinary when sports come back. It's just a desire. I like the reference to Cheers final season. No, nobody is any. No, 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 no. Maybe, maybe like the Mash final episode. Let's just go all the way back. Uh, yeah. Uh, so yes, for those of you who are Digiday Plus members, Pat and I are going to discuss the Eagles drafting of Jalen Hurts for three hours directly after this. Uh, this. Oh man! Again, join Digiday Plus. Use TNN uh, code, and you'll get to join for three hours of what the hell are the Eagles doing? <laughs> um, but what are you guys doing to bridge the gap? Sports are coming back. And we'll get to that. Um, you know, there's going to be it, it'll, it could get, it could be kind of weird. But like, as I said in the intro, like sports have to come back. And also, this is America. There's too much yep. money. Like, there's too much money. I'm sorry. Yep. What are I you mean, doing we, to bridge the gap? What are you doing to bridge the gap? We, we as a publisher continue to create content that we think is going to support an audience. If you look at, we mentioned earlier, at midnight, the Colorado made full mobile sports betting and cross-platform sports betting available. We cover that like we do any beat. We cover sports being like it is a NFL beat or an NBA beat or Major League Baseball. So we, we, have, we really want to be a reference brand for sports betting, which is not just from a consumer perspective, but almost like how I think Digi Digiday is obviously sort of a vertical business uh, and advertising and all the verticals you go in, we want to cover our own category. So when CNBC wants the latest projections and metrics around a certain industry, uh, they're going to call an expert and they call us and we're frequently there for that. So we color covered the launch in Colorado like we would an NFL game. And we have a ton of content there, but we've done some fun stuff like a King of the Hill tournament where we did a 64 player bracket simulated on NBA 2K 
with contests and prizing and our talent watching and commenting and talking shit back and forth, which is super fun. I mentioned the NFL draft. We were up almost 150% year over year. So we continue to support our social handles and drive content into all the things that we're doing. Um, Twitch has become a new channel that we think is a pretty interesting yeah. video experience that we're starting to create content for, which has been fun wait, as well. Wait, wait, Pat, can, can you talk about that a little? I know uh, we have a we have a, a visual from this um, this uh, effort, the, the stump, the stuck. Um, Stucky, one of our one of our talent, who's actually a Philly guy. Um, <laughs> oh, good. He is, yeah. Explain, explain here. This is on Twitch. I think Twitch is interesting because we got a, we had a question from Je Jeff. Jeff, uh, excuse me, Jeff. That's the economist, Greg Sachs, uh, talking about esports being a venue that could attract uh, casual betters. Um, oh, e uh, I mean that's a good pivot. But esports is something we do a lot more coverage of now than we ever have before because you know it's it's becoming a, a market where people can bet in. One of the challenges is most of the the betting that's available for esports is offshore. Um, so we don't really work with any offshore books at all. So if more of the onshore legal sports books start to pro pro provide odds and you start to see betting in esports, we'll cover it even more. But with the dearth of games going on, people are super engaged. Our engineers and a lot of content people are esports. One of our investors, a firm called Bitcraft, is a big esports venture investor. So uh, it, it's a category that's interesting. But you know, esports has its challenges. Integrity is one of the challenges. Integrity being, you know, are people fixing games? Like, is there is there the ability to create really reasonable lines and really reasonable pricing around it? Because it's so new and it's so in flux. Um, you know, I mean, there's things like drone racing. I mean, people will bet on anything. And I'll say that I miss my office dearly and I miss my colleagues, but there, there isn't a day that goes by that there isn't some darts event or a cornhole tournament or a, you know, chipping golf balls kind of, you know, bro activity or, or any other thing that people don't want to have a wager on. It was really fun watching the, I don't know if people, I assume some are watching the last dance on ESPN about uh, Jordan's last season and the last season of the Bulls. And I loved seeing even last week, uh, Jordan settling a bet on the plane for the Broncos win against the Packers and handing someone a hundred bucks. Like, betting you started out with the conversation betting is part of a culture and lifestyle that is never going to go away and one that's going to get more mainstream and we think action is a position to be uh, a major player with all of those convergences of realities of sports betting um yeah i mean that uh, you talk about people betting on anything um that that leads me into the to asking you about this 12-hour push-up challenge um by fantasy labs co-founder jonathan bales he looks also he, based he, in Philly. There's weird Philly connections everywhere. Yeah, this is great. He looks like he's uh, he uh, can do a lot of uh, a lot of push-ups. Frankly, he can. That's that's his in his apartment in, in uh, downtown Philadelphia. He he's one of the founders of the company, and he did a fun bet with a number of his. You know, he's he's big in the sort of social community around sports betting, and is is a pretty famous player in DFS. Has won multiple million dollars in DFS, and was the founder of Fantasy Labs and. He was goaded by some of his friends and people on Twitter to see if he could do 2,500 push-ups in 12 hours. Oh my so, God. Um, and he did it. And it was fun. I was texting with him during the middle of it. My kids were watching it. It was at, at dinner time when that finished. And uh, you know, he had a pretty big audience. And this was our first opportunity to stand up Twitch as an opportunity and platform for engagement. And hey, are we gonna be in the push-up business for the rest of our time? Probably not. But <laughs> This shows the creativity of our content organization, the creativity of our community organization, and the creativity of our product org to, you know, get shit done in the time when when people want to be engaged and have fun. I, uh, yeah, I mean, we have a uh, prison workouts uh, uh, private Slack channel where we challenge <laughs> each other to make, make okay. do with what we got. Um, uh, we also have this late night poker tournaments. You're doing your your trying some some yeah we, with some of our talent you can see worldwide wob there and and colin wilson and justin fan but also bringing in some of the most famous uh poker tournament players in the world people who have won world poker tournaments and you know people are looking for something to do we're all at home and there's only so much call of duty you can play and there's only so much netflix but you know we we like 
supporting things like poker, which we wouldn't say is, you know, your typical casino game that doesn't have an edge and doesn't have an opportunity to play against someone to use edge. You know, our business, that's our, our base subscription platform is called edge. And everything we do is about giving prescriptive advice about how you should bet and be more informed. And we think poker is an area where unlike say blackjack or roulette or some of the other typical casino and parlor games, you can actually have edge. And so we can cover poker like we do a lot of other categories around the platform and at Action Network. Okay, and you mentioned The Last Dance. You did a memorabilia show. I know you've been like posting nonstop on, on Twitter some, I mean, I can't find my uh, baseball card collection, which is roughly overlaps. I mean, you're a couple of years older, I believe. Yeah. Um, I, but uh, it roughly overlaps. I mean, my my baseball card collecting days were, were mostly between like 1980 and 1984, but uh, you were, I think you were just a little bit small overlap. I, I definitely, I mean, I, I was an obsessive baseball card collector. I have kept them in a box at my home here in an undisclosed location on Eastern Long Island. And every night, maybe after a cocktail or two, I will go through those and post them on Twitter for people like you and other friends that I know are watching. Yeah. Um, and one of my close friends and colleagues, Darren Ravel at Action, he has been doing these memorabilia shows and he's going to continue to do them. And his network of followers and people he's covered his entire career, people like Cal Ripken. Ripken brought on his Jordans from a game-worn pair of Jordans from 97. And Ravel talked to a memorabilia expert who said those were worth 75 grand. And, um, and he was actually at the game. And just talking to people like Nat Turner, who's a friend and a, and a and a inveterate baseball card and memorabilia card and collector. And I think just the, the last dance and ESPN, which has done, you know, the best ratings in the history of that platform, ESPN, in terms of a documentary, people are craving to discuss Jordan memorabilia and Jordan stories about betting. Um, you know, you and I being Sixers fans, I mean, I think a lot of Knicks fans hate Jordan a lot more than I do because of what he, he's done. But I was a Jordan freak as a kid. I owed lawns in 1984 to be able to pay for my first pair of Jordans and took SEPTA into downtown Center City to a shady, you know, store and paid cash for mowing lawns and got my first pair of Jordans. And I've been a collector ever since. So memorabilia is super fun. He's gotten great people. George Carl, one of the coaches of the Dream Team he had last week who they appraised a Dream Team signed 1992 Olympics gold medal uniform. I mean, that's it's just fun stuff. And but, but there's, this there's, also there's, feels like something that's like right up Darren Ravel's alley. Like, I mean, right? Like, I'm wondering which of these things stick around because I think a lot of us and everyone in the publishing industry is trying new things. And the question ends up becoming what sticks around because I know we've got, you know, politics, for instance. You, you're doing more with, with, with politics betting, right? I mean, Tommy uh, uh, Burr is back with, you know, asking about betting outside of sports and the Academy Awards and politics. Um, mm -hmm. But um, which of these kind of sticks around? I mean, is politics, it's going to be big. We'll, we'll see. I mean, West Virginia posted odds very briefly and pulled them quickly. I mean, we'll cover anything that legal books will have odds against. So that could be, that could be just about anything. I mean, DraftKings just this past year had legal odds against the Academy Awards. Um, you know, we'll, 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 we'll do that. Um, you know, it's, it's fun to cover these things. I don't think you're, you're, your average sophisticated better is typically not going to bet it in mass here, but um, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's an interesting thing to cover and it gets attention. Okay. So let's get to, to after, you know, this bridge, when are sports coming back? What are your, what are your odds? What are we, what are we looking at? Um, yep. You mentioned baseball uh, in July. Are they doing that thing where they're sticking everyone like in, in Arizona or what do you, we heard rumors. I mean, Cal very explicit about not having any real gatherings around events for maybe the next of the rest of the year. So I'd see the 49ers A's and Dodgers and, and angels perhaps moving to Texas. I'm, I'm hearing Texas, Arizona, and Florida. They want to get a hundred games in um, is, is rumored. Rumors are July 1st or 4th around there doing double headers every weekend, having uh, neutral warm weather sites for the playoffs and extending the playoffs maybe into December, early December. You know, we, we don't have a real line of sight or anything that uh, more than others do, but we, we are preparing for what we think is going to be the biggest fall in the history of sports with 
You're going to have the Masters. You're going to have baseball. You're going to have football. College football is going to be a question mark, but you could have uh, a, a finish to the NBA season and a, and a truncated playoffs. But we're, we're praying for all those things because, like I said, I think this could be the biggest sports fall ever. And we also have a couple more states coming legal in uh, and mobile by the end of the year in Tennessee yeah. and Virginia. So, but there, but there needs to be sports for people to bet on. Yes. We don't, we don't care if people are watching them in venue, but we do need sports for people to bet on. Bundesliga, we've heard, has been pushed out a little bit. UFC, that, that just in another week or so, those two golf tournaments that we mentioned, the PGA Tour, uh, who's a big partner of ours, we've created a platform with the tour called Golf Bet, and the tour is talking about a return mid-next month. There's, there's probably no better social distancing sport there is than golf. Um, NASCAR, we're hearing about returning next week as well. Um, all of these things people can bet on and we're excited to create content platform and tools to help people bet on them. But, um, you know, all of these things are moving to targets. And when we finally get a calendar, I mean, the NFL is probably not too far from releasing its schedule. Okay. So let's talk about that. Cause I mean, the NFL, I, has, I've heard, th th that has to be half your engagement, right? It, it, it is the biggest, well, college and professional football are our biggest, but professional football for sure is our largest. Um, yeah. The NFL is just, is so massive that um, I think when we talk about all these different sports, we forget that for all the stuff about CTE and stuff, the NFL is as close as we have truly to like a national sport. Yep. Um, there's too much money at stake for the NFL not to have a season, right? I believe so. I mean, I th it, 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 their, whether it's their television uh, contracts, uh, the, the import to what you said in terms of the national, the national psyche, there's, there's just nothing bigger. Um, you know, Sunday is reserved for the NFL. We'll see if, if college football is not happening. I think you could see, and it se seems absurd to say, an even bigger NFL season. Um, I think the NFL has had its ups and downs in terms of its uh, in, in politics, et cetera. But last year was a banner year for the NFL in terms of ratings, in terms of just about anything. And I think all of those realities are going to be the case this year. We just have to have games happen. I, I, I will be curious to see if people are going to be live for them. But, you know, my team gives me grief because I like to say that such and such a thing is our Super Bowl, um, whether it's the NCAA tournament, which actually in many ways is bigger than the NFL. It's not as elongated over time, but NFL is the one that people most understand. It's like their first introduction to betting. I mean, you and I are a little older, but I've spent some time with Vince Lombardi, who he was a play, a, a, a GM and was with the, the Patriots and Browns for years and worked with Belichick. He used to say when he worked for CBS, when you oh, walk Mike through Lombardi. an airport. You said with, this. Yeah, yeah I was Mike like, Lombardi. my God, Pat, you yeah. are a few years old. Yeah, no, I am. No, I meant Mike Lombardi. And he used to say that when you'd walk through the airport, players, they would be the talent. The person who had most attention was Jimmy the Greek. Um, and it was, you know, that was when CBS had betting part of its its content. Yeah, I know most of those people have no idea who Jimmy the Greek is, but like, again, you know, sports betting has been part of the culture and vernacular forever, and it's only going to get bigger, and there's so many net new people coming into it. I think, you know, people talk about Gen Z and, and millennials. They, they're an audience of bettors that kind of grew up with betting. They grew up with a democratized internet they grew up with the ability to have endless access to data and information unlike we did when we were growing up. So these are more informed bettors and they're betting everywhere. And I think that's just going to continue. I mean, you look at New Jersey, New Jersey, 87% of its handle is mobile. Like I think something like 40% of, of, of bets are within a two mile radius of the border, which tells you a lot of people are coming in from New York and Pennsylvania. You know, we as a team do these, we call them betting brunches that we'll do on a Thursday or a Friday or a Wednesday and just get ready for the weekend and go to a diner in Hoboken and bet for, uh, stare at our phones for 45 minutes, not look at each other, bet, and then get back on the path and go back to New York. Uh, and that we'll see how that behavior changes post COVID, but it'll be interesting. A form of social distancing. By the way, has 30 for 30 done like a Jimmy the Greek? I, I know there was a, I think there was, I don't know if it was 30 for 30 or one of their E60 things, but um, yes, there was a, you know, his, his whole, yeah, he's a, he's a long story. Yeah, the of, downfall, of, uh, yeah. the Sports Illustrated article, there's a lot there. If not, yeah, you Showtime, Showtime did a, a, 
a documentary. I don't know how many parts it was, maybe four on sports betting earlier this year. Um, so it's definitely, it's, it's becoming more part of the culture with legalization and, um, and all of the other momentum that's been happening politically in sports betting. Okay, so you're expecting NFL this fall, sometime this fall. We are, we are. That's in your scenario. It is. Is there like, is there like a worst case scenario where there's no betting, there's a second wave? Like, I mean, how are you scenario planning that? Or is it just like, look, we're going with this as the scenario? I mean, we're going with this as our scenario today. All, all bets are off if things change. We could see that changing and we don't really have control of that, of that calendar. And, you know, every day, even our own government, that seems to change whether the second or not. If it, if it bleeds into 21, we have contingencies to figure out against that, but we, we want to be prepared for, like I mentioned earlier, I mean, we're fortunate and I, I, I don't want to, to belittle the people in other industries, but we know sports will come back. We know sports betting has tremendous momentum. The tax deficit that every state is facing right now, I think will push forward more of their comfort with making sports betting legal. If New York happens next year in the first or second quarter, Florida, um, those are going to be massive opportunities. Um, Massachusetts, like you're going to start to see uh, a very interesting, massive market that will only get bigger. And it's just for us, we're, we as a business want to be in a position to be ready to create content, to create tools. And that's one of the things that's sort of helpful. I, I, I wouldn't have wished for this, but it'll, it gives our time for the product and engineering organizations to take a breather for a moment and to build upon our great product leads and build upon what we think is one of the best products, if not the best product in the industry. Yeah. So I want to, again, encourage people, if you have any final questions, to please uh, pop them in the Q&A function. Um, happy, to, happy to field them. Um, but the last thing is just like also, you know, you've been in this industry for a, a long time and you've been through uh, two, down, two big Biggish downturns. Maybe this is bigger. Uh, you know, with the dot com bust and then um, the financial crisis. Um, don't, don't forget September 11th. What's well, yeah, dot. Com, well, I kind of like those are sort of yeah they, together. They yes. together. I mean, like I almost feel like you know the dot com bust was like you know September 11th just kind of bookended it um, in yeah. some ways for this industry. I, I think mm -hmm. that's that's a fair point. Um, what what are the similarities and then what are the differences you see as far as the the impact overall to to the industry and business? I mean, the similarities are are just sort of the in near instant shut of budget in certain categories, be it marketing, advertising, just general investment. But I think some of those others were you had a little bit of of a degree of predictability around it. I think in this instance we have less predictability. I think. You know, as a former Googler and, and shareholder, I say this not just because I work there, um, but, Google, you know, advertising and marketing are often the first things that are cut. But I think Google's your last thing to get cut and your first thing to get turned on because it's distribution. You know, I watch CNBC more than I care to. I'm not a, a, a markets analyst, but people are talking about a V-shaped recovery. And there was no systemic issues in the general uh, monetary system. Like this was something that was such an exogenous, unpredictable factor that unfortunately they're just going to be businesses that are going to see generational, generational decline. And I don't think we felt that in a recession of 2008. I don't think I felt that in 2001. I mean, we have to take our shoes off when we get on planes and things like that, that are kind of been, uh, you know, sustained, but, but this one is going to be interesting for what it does to in industries that are going to be unfortunately challenged for a few years. Um, we, we don't see sports being one of them selfishly in our world, but in the ad world, uh, you know, you, you look at just general consumer behavior. When's the next vacation we're going to go on? You know, when are the, the things that we typically used to do, when are those going to happen? I'm not entirely sure. I mean, we hear vaccine and we hear opportunity, but like in terms of being, you know, I don't know about your organization, but half of our product and engineering corp, uh, uh, group is, works remote always anyway, our content organization similarly. So we were as a business, we're able to collaborate and work remotely very well. Digital tools like the one we're on in Zoom make, make that easy for us. So what's the new norm of business is gonna be interesting because all of our business is digital and it can still go in that fashion. So the FANG organizations that continue to be digital like ours 
I feel pretty good about. Um, it's just, uh, it's, it's just, it's very different than 2008 or 2001. I, I can't even compare them. Yeah, more lasting. Okay, we'll leave it there. But Pat, thank you so much. Really appreciate you joining us. Good to see you uh, as always, Frank.